The Tom Woods Show, episode 2179. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you enjoy The Tom Woods Show, it's time to go to the next level. And next level Tom Woods is libertyclassroom.com. This is where my friends and I teach all the stuff you did not get in your conventional education, history, economics, and more, the way it ought to be taught with all the content they left out or distorted. Check it out at libertyclassroom.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Very glad to have Jason Jewell with us. Jason is the chairman of the Department of Humanities at Faulkner University. I've known Jason for about 20 years now and I can vouch for him as a scholar and as a person. So I'm thrilled to be able to have this conversation with him about the subject matter of a course he just created for libertyclassroom.com, my website that I like to think of as my dashboard university, filled with courses teaching you things they'd rather you not know. And of course, you can consume them on the go. You can consume these courses at three o'clock in the morning if you like or whenever. They're just sitting there waiting for you to view or listen to them. And this particular course, I guess is obvious from the title of the episode, has to do with the crimes of communism, which people more or less, you know, sometimes they acknowledge them in theory, but you don't hear that much about them. And I think it's important to keep them uppermost in our minds. So Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot, Tom. It's great to be here. Jason, you have done, and I'm sure it was not an easy task at all, but a very, very important thing for the world in creating this course on the crimes of communism. Now, I'm sure there are courses on communism out there, but I'm not quite so sure that there is exactly what you've done in the form of a video course, or of course, we also make available the audio for people on the go. You could just listen to it while you're driving. So it's great that you did it, and it was your idea. I wish I could take credit for this, but this was your idea, and I'm glad you did it on our platform. So let's start off, first of all, with the historical discussion of these sorts of things, because you can find on the one hand some fairly credentialed people contributing to something called the Black Book of Communism that lays bare a lot of what went on. But on the other hand, you find even to this day somewhat unrepentant people saying that the numbers are overblown, that the West has a vested interest in exaggerating the crimes of communism so as to divert attention from all the crimes caused by capitalism and stuff like that. To what extent did you have to reckon with that in putting this material together? Well, the Black Book of Communism was a very important source for the course. And if anything, what you have said about people saying the West overstates the crimes of communism, I would say it's the reverse. I mean, we've got so many of these regimes that are still in power, even though they have reformed somewhat over the years. And if anything, there's a lot of information still to come out about the crimes of communism in places like North Korea or Vietnam. Obviously, we have a lot of good information that has come from the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union fell and the archives were declassified to a great extent in the 1990s, a wealth of information came out then. But in places like Cuba, China, you know, there's probably still a lot of information that we don't have about the extent to which these governments repress their own populations. So to an extent, we do have to work with estimates. And you can always say that some estimate is too high or too low. Some of the estimates of the death toll brought about by these governments, they vary pretty widely in different countries. I try to take account of that in the lecture series to try to give you know, what I think is a reasonable number for the death toll. But no matter if if you take the low end of these numbers, you still got communism being by far the most deadly ideology in world history. And that's something that I never really learned about in my formal education. I don't know that a lot of students get that today. So I thought it was important that we talk about that. You start off, I mean, most of the course is a matter of visiting one region of the world after another and examining what actually happened under communism in that place. So, but you start off with foundations. So you got to say a little bit about Marxism and so on and so forth. So based on that material, how do you evaluate the claim that we're being unfair because none of these regimes were real communism? 
or Karl Marx would have repudiated them or not recognized them as springing from his thought. It is true that none of these states fit Marx's definition of communism. And so I tried to distinguish that. You know, whenever you had the Soviet Union, for example, the Bolsheviks take over Russia and they don't say we now have communism. They say we have socialism and we're on our way to communism. So all of the things that they did with the gulag and the summary executions of people and the war crimes, all of that, that was all in the name of building socialism so we could eventually have communism. So I defined the crimes of communism in the course as crimes committed by communists in an effort to bring about communism. So it doesn't matter whether the regime in the Soviet Union or Afghanistan or wherever was literally a state of communism as defined by Marx. That was the goal. So I think it fits. Now, socialism, of course, the definition there I use is the classical one where the state owns the means of production. I do talk a little bit about how self-described socialists have tried to move the goalposts on that. You have a lot of people calling themselves democratic socialists or some other term that in the 20th century wouldn't have been considered socialist. And I actually go through how the definition of socialism has changed in the last 30 years in order for people on the left to try to hang on to that term, even though classical socialism failed so miserably in all these communist states. I've done a number of episodes on the Russian Revolution just because I find it so fascinating. And also because I think a lot of people seem to be more interested in Stalin and the Stalinist period because the crimes were just so scarlet, I guess. But in a way, it's like focusing on World War II and then forgetting about World War I, which a lot of people implicitly seem to do. World War I is an extremely important historical moment, as is the Russian Revolution and as is Lenin as a historical figure. So maybe we can start there. I mean, Lenin really led a minority movement. I mean, the Bolsheviks were not by any stretch of the imagination a majority of the public, and yet somehow they managed to have this extraordinary victory. But what do you think about this? It's true. Even as late as October of 1917, as they're about to pull off this revolution, the Bolshevik party only has about 2,000 members. So it is quite small. And Lenin knew that they were very much a minority and he wanted to get out in front of the other leftist groups, seize power in such a way that he wouldn't have to share power with anybody else. And then one of the first things that he does when they get hold of the machinery of government is start to purge other leftist groups. So one of the things that occurs really around the world, in fact, you read something like the Black Book of Communism, and for someone who doesn't have much sympathy with socialists, it it does get kind of tedious reading all of the details of how these Bolsheviks and people inspired by the Bolsheviks went through these various purges of all the other left-wing groups because they never wanted to share power with other leftists who might have more of a base of popular support in whatever country we're talking about. So it was very important for them not to give the population any other options if they wanted to be on the left. So we've got case after case of large numbers of rival leftist groups being rounded up and either executed or put into concentration camps or discredited or purged in various ways. And that's just one of the facets of the repressive tendencies of the communists whenever they get into power. But it took a while for the Bolsheviks in Russia to get to the point where they felt confident enough. Of course, we've got a civil war in Russia that runs until 1921 after the Bolsheviks take power. And I think the precarious situation that the Bolsheviks found themselves in is that they weren't willing to adopt maybe a more moderate posture that would have allowed them to cooperate with other leftist groups and maybe make a go at forming some kind of government that would have made some kind of changes in the direction that they wanted without insisting on having the whole enchilada and trying to move towards full socialism very rapidly. What can we say about Lenin as a person based on what we observe him doing in these critical few years? He's an extremely ideological 
thinker. He's one of these guys that someone like Edmund Burke would have warned the world about, trying to fit the square peg of his ideology into the round hole of reality. He was very insistent that he could remake humanity into the new socialist man. He didn't think there was any sort of fixed human nature that couldn't be reshaped into the way the socialists wanted people to behave. And from the very beginning, he and the people who were his closest allies in the Bolshevik party, people like Felix Zerzhinsky, who forms the first secret police in Russia, they are very clear in saying, look, we might have to uh, just kill maybe 10% of the population who are recalcitrant, but we're pretty sure the rest of them will be pliable, that we can remold them into the kind of people we want them to be. So as you referred to earlier, there's been this sort of myth on the left of the good Lenin, bad Stalin in the 20th century. And this argument goes something like this, that Lenin was the idealistic visionary who came in and was really concerned with helping the common people and all of that. And unfortunately, he died after only being in power a few years. And then the cynical, hard-bitten guy named Stalin comes in and kind of steers the revolution in a different direction. And he's the one who's responsible for all the bad stuff. Now, as, as you know, that myth is not tenable any longer since we've had all of the information come out after 1991. But we've got quotations from Lenin from the get-go saying, we've got to use terror. We've got to use the secret police. We're not concerned with any bourgeois notion of justice. All of these kinds of things are of a piece with the kind of stuff that Stalin did, absent maybe some of the aspects of the cult of personality that Stalin was interested in creating around himself. Yeah, it's really just a smaller scale of what Stalin later did. The differences are really one of number, but the institutional arrangement is already in place for Stalin. That's the thing. How can you absolve Lenin if you're even going to claim that he meant to prevent somebody like a Stalin from taking power. Well, apparently he failed completely, so that's something worth noting. There's a great book by uh, Richard Pipes I've mentioned a lot. Richard Pipes has a series of books on Russia before and during and after this period. They're huge. But there's a one-volume work called A Concise History of the Russian Revolution for people who don't have that kind of time, and I'm glad he did that. And really what he's portraying in this book is, it's like a giant mental institution. The legal system, he says, instead of what we have in the West, where at least in principle, we have all these law books and they have precedents in them and we at least make some show of consulting them and there's at least some predictability of what happens. Lenin's view was that all you needed to be a judge was to have a revolutionary consciousness. Forget about being steeped in these bourgeois precedents. We don't need that. We need you to have a revolutionary consciousness. I think my favorite anecdote out of that book by Pipes is they attempted to have concerts for the proletariat, where instead of symphony orchestras, the concerts would be like the kinds of noises that would be made in industrial production and whistles and whatever, screeches of various kinds. And of course, nobody could make anything out because this is insanity. It's unbelievable what went on. Yeah, Pipes' books are great. I've got one or two of them here myself. One of my favorite sections in, I think it's Russia Under Bolshevik Rule is the title of the volume I'm thinking of. He has an entire chapter on Lenin's war against the church. And in 1921, 1922, Lenin mounted a very systematic campaign against the Russian Orthodox Church in particular. And this was coming on, you know, thinking of his going back decades, he's on record as having said as early as the 1890s, for example, that, you know, famine is a good thing because it will hasten the production of a, an urban proletariat. It also will decrease people's religious faith. You know, they have a, a famine that comes through and kills a lot of people. People will lose their faith in God. And so he thought that was a great thing. And then he comes in very systematically in the early 20s and goes after monasteries, Russian Orthodox priests, nuns. We've got records of a number of martyrdoms in that year. 
8,000 roughly priests, monks, and nuns murdered by the Bolsheviks. And you know, more people talk about how Stalin went after the churches in the late 1930s. But as you said earlier, you know, everything was already there with Lenin, and maybe on a smaller scale, but Pipes documents all of those incidents very well. And his books are well worth a read for anybody interested in the subject. Of course, the number of Catholics in Russia was quite small, but Lenin went after them also and was insisting that the churches turn over their sacred vessels like chalices to be melted down and sold off for the purpose of famine relief. And I guess it was Pope Benedict XV at the time said, look, we do not want you to do this to these sacred vessels. So you tell us the amount you need for famine relief and we'll send you a check in an amount equivalent to the value of the vessels so that you don't need to do this. And Lenin did not even acknowledge this offer because, of course, that's not... He wants the humiliation and he wants to assert dominance. He wants to do this. And, of course, the money just goes to buy weapons from the Germans, not going to famine relief. Herbert Hoover is trying to do something about the famine in Russia, but not so much Lenin. That's right. Of course, a lot of the people, the Catholics in Russia, were Poles living in the western part of Ukraine. And then, obviously, in later years, this would have been under Stalin, but after the Soviet Union invades Poland and gets hold of a lot of that land that Russia had lost in World War I, then you see a lot more systematic efforts against the Catholic Church, not just within the Soviet Union, but also in the Eastern Bloc countries that the Russians were controlling indirectly during the Cold War. So there are a number of bishops who are arrested and priests mysteriously disappearing and all these kinds of things going on throughout the 20th century in the places where the communists have sway. And I go into some of those stories in more detail in in the series. Folks, let's take a minute to thank our great sponsor, Liquid IV. You get told all the time how important it is to stay hydrated, especially during these hot summer months. Well, people who tell you that aren't just trying to annoy you. They really, really are looking out for what is best for you. Making hydration a priority can help you feel healthier in your everyday life. And one stick of liquid IV in 16 ounces of water hydrates you twice as fast and more efficiently than water alone. A lot of people use it first thing in the morning or before a workout. I drink it like, let's say, mid to early afternoon when I'm starting to lose a little bit of my punch here over at the Tom Woods Show, and it helps. It's convenient, easy to use, makes me feel great, and it's got all different flavors. And because I am a very sentimental kind of person, I like the flavors that remind me of my childhood. What can I say? So I like Concord grape, okay? I like tropical punch and strawberry, okay? And you're bound to find one that you love as well. Liquid IV is going to deliver to you three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks, five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and vitamin C. So go check it out. Grab your Liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 15% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code WOODS at checkout. That's 15% off anything you order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code WOODS at liquidiv.com. Let's say, indeed, though, something about Stalin. Let's give the people what they want. Now, Stalin, if you believe current-day polls, and here I mean P-O-L-L-S, if you follow them, there seems to be some suggestion that a lot of Russians view him somewhat favorably, you know, as the, the leader of a determined and strong Russia surrounded by enemies. And it's, it almost makes you despair for mankind when you look at the Great Terror, the purges, the terror famine in Ukraine, which, by the way, the left tries to claim was not deliberately engineered, it just happened, and it's been exaggerated and all that, it's very, very hard to make sense of how you could look at somebody like that and say, well, you know, on the other hand, he had his good points. Well, everybody likes a winner. Not, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people do. And the experience of Russia in World War II with the what they called the Great Patriotic War does bring about, even though Stalin has done all these horrible things in the 20s and 30s, the German invasion helped bring about, to some extent, a kind of reconciliation between the Russian people and the Soviet government. I mean, the, everybody hated Stalin. They hated what had been going on with the collectivization of agriculture, 
and the show trials and the purges and all of that in the 30s. But when the Nazis came in, of course, they viewed the Slavic people as subhuman. So they treated them absolutely horrifically. And a lot of people were put into the position of saying, well, if I've got to choose one or the other, at least I'll choose the guy who's more like me in certain respects, ethnically or something like that. So there's something of a reconciliation with the Russian people as a result of the war. And then even with the de-Stalinization programming that happens after Stalin's death in the 1950s, from that point on, a lot of the problems of central planning start to become more evident with the people. There's you know, shortages of consumer goods all through the Cold War in Russia. And I think for a lot of those people who kind of suffered through the Cold War and then, of course, the way Russia fared internationally with its loss of prestige and everything after the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 90s, it's not entirely surprising that some people would look back to the Stalinist era and say, well, at least Russia you know, played a major role on the world stage in those days. And so maybe some kind of nostalgic element helps them to paper over some of those kinds of repressions that maybe they might not have experienced directly, or maybe only members of their distant family had experienced directly. But you're right, it is very disappointing to think that some people are thinking, what we really need is a new Stalin in Russia. And so of course, a lot of people try to associate Vladimir Putin was Stalin in some sense. I'm not sure how all that works. But when you look closely at Stalin's record and the kinds of things that were actually going on in Russia, it's really hard to think that anybody would want a reincarnation of him in any way. Can you talk about the Great Terror a bit? Because I, what, I, what I want to get at is, I remember in my own reading on this, coming across this kind of stuff, whereby... Clearly innocent people who had nothing to do with anything were also targeted. And you think, why would you not just go after the people you, whether Stalin really felt like there was sabotage or there were people out to get him, who knows, probably. But you'd think you would just laser focus it on those people and teach everybody else a lesson. Why would you go after people who clearly had nothing to do with anything? And the idea supposedly behind this was to keep everybody off balance because the other way, you might feel like, well, if, as long as I keep my head down, I stay out of trouble, I'll be fine. But you want everybody to be completely disoriented, that no matter what you do, you could wind up in trouble. And it just keeps everybody on edge and just seeking after self-preservation rather than you know anything else. Is that really, you think, how it went? I think there's certainly an element of truth to that. The scholars that I've, I've been reading, you know, they pretty much argue that there's two goals. And they do think that this purge, this terror in the mid to late 1930s was really directed by Stalin, that it comes from the top. It's not just, you know, some overzealous, you know, party officials going too far, that this really is something coming from Stalin. But one of the goals that Stalin had was to reshape the Communist Party in the Soviet Union so that it's completely devoted to him personally. There's a lot of old Bolsheviks who had taken part in the revolutions of 1917 and who had been there with Lenin from the early days. A lot of those guys Stalin viewed as suspect because they had seen, maybe had sided with some of Stalin's rivals in those power struggles of the 1920s after Lenin's death. Also, Stalin had been a military commander during the Civil War, during the later stages of you know, Lenin's time, and he had really been incompetent. <laughs> There's a lot of institutional memory in the Soviet army that didn't have much faith in Stalin because they had seen how he had behaved as a commander in those earlier years. And so he wanted to clean house in the army as well. And I run through in the lectures the percentage of top-ranking officers in the Soviet army and Navy who were purged during this period. And it's something like 90% of the top tier of the officer corps is out after this. And then, of course, that means that when World War II begins, the Soviet army is in really a bad way. One of the ironies of that is that because there's such poor leadership, a lot of the officer corps at the beginning of World War II 
are these very green guys who are selected because of their political loyalty to Stalin. They know nothing about military command. And early on, the Russian army fares very poorly. A lot of guys are taken prisoner. And so they suffer in POW camps, German POW camps throughout the war. And then at the end of the war, they're all treated as traitors because they've had too much Western exposure. So they wind up as prisoners because of Stalin's purge of the officer corps. And then they wind up in camps in, in Siberia at the end of the war because they had to, <laughs> because Stalin didn't trust them afterwards. So there's several layers of craziness here. But that was one of Stalin's goals was to purge the party and make it loyal to him personally. So this is where we get, you know, the pursuit of the Trotskyites and all of that, the assassination of Trotsky ultimately in Mexico in 1940. Then I think the other goal there was to, if not keep everybody off balance, at least do a big purge of what at the time would have been called socially dangerous elements in the Soviet Union. So these are people who had any conceivable connection to the Kulak class or to old you know, family connections to old czarist officials or even just people who had been relocated earlier and had left the region that they had been deported to earlier in the 30s. They're trying to track down these people who have swelled the homeless populations of cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg. There's a lot of uneasiness and uncertainty on the part of Stalin that society is getting out of control to some extent because some of these earlier initiatives hadn't panned out the way he wanted to. So that element of keeping everyone in fear, keeping them off balance and unwilling to challenge party control, I think is a real element of the purges. Now, the big historian here, as you probably know, during the Cold War was Robert Conquest, who wrote books about the Great Terror in the 60s and in the 80s. Some historians think that his numbers were inflated. Of course, he was working with information that, uh, you know, before the declassification of all these documents in the 90s. But we're still talking about numbers that are in the millions of people who were arrested or deported or incarcerated somehow, and definitely hundreds of thousands of people executed during the Great Terror. He also wrote Harvest of Sorrow about the Ukraine terror famine, which is very much worth reading also. Jason, let's continue this conversation tomorrow. We'll start doing a little bit of a tour of the world and get a glimpse at some of these places. But Jason's is, I don't know, maybe you're the 29th course. I'm not, I haven't even kept track anymore. But we have a lot of courses at libertyclassroom.com. And of course, you can consume them anytime you want. You don't have to you know, be there at 3.30 p.m. or something like that. If you want to listen to them at 3.30 in the morning, you're welcome to do that. The site's been around for 10 years, so it has stood the test of time. There are thousands and thousands of libertarians learning the history and economics they did not get in school at Liberty Classroom. So I actually have very temporary, by the way, a coupon code for a pretty steep discount on it if you'd like to be a member of Liberty Classroom. You get every single course we have, including Jason's most recent one on communism. Just go to libertyclassroom.com and at checkout, use the code Jason for Jason Jewell and you'll be very happy. You'll be raising a glass to Jason's name when you see how big the discount is. So Jason, thanks so much. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks a lot, Tom. All right, everybody. You know what? Let's forget the whole coupon code thing. Let's forget that. I'm just going to run a discount on the site. No coupon code necessary, but it's not going to be up for very long. So as soon as you hear this, you got to race over to libertyclassroom.com and take advantage of this offer because I do want to celebrate the release of Jason's course which you get along with all the other courses when you join the site. So check that out, libertyclassroom.com, and more with Jason tomorrow. See you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.